Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston. Welcome to lecture 31 of Introductory Linear Algebra. In today's class, we're going to finally formally introduce the idea of the dimension of a subspace. Okay, so this is something that we've talked about informally a couple of times up, on, up until now. We've talked about the idea that a line is one-dimensional and a plane is two-dimensional, but we haven't really seen what this means. Like, what does it mean for a subspace to be two-dimensional? Or even worse than that, like in higher dimensions, what does it mean for a subspace to be 47-dimensional? Certainly we have some idea that, hey, this should be bigger than a two-dimensional dimensional subspace, but like how do we distinguish a 47 dimensional subspace from a 46 dimensional or 48 dimensional subspace? Really what is dimension? And in today's class we're going to finally pin that down. Okay, and where this definition comes from, it comes from this theorem up here. Okay, so it comes from this theorem 8.1. So we're just going to state this theorem. We're not actually going to prove it. The proof is in the textbook if you're curious. Okay, but what this theorem says is that, well, if you start off with any subspace of Rn, then every single basis of that subspace is going to have the same number of vectors in it. Okay, so remember we talked about in the previous lecture that every subspace, it has lots of different bases. Well, now we're saying even though it has lots of different bases, they all have the same number of vectors in them. So if you can find some basis with seven vectors, then every basis is going to have seven vectors. And it's this uniqueness of a size of a basis of a subspace that lets us define the dimension of the subspace. Okay, so here it is. It's definition time. All right, so suppose you've got any subspace of Rn. Then we say that the dimension of that subspace is the number of vectors in any of its bases. Okay, and because each of its bases has the same number of vectors in it, it doesn't matter which one you choose. Okay, this definition actually makes sense. Okay, so the way that you compute the dimension of a subspace of Rn is you just construct any old basis of it, doesn't matter which one, and then you just count up how many vectors are in there. That's the dimension. Okay, and maybe just as one minor technicality before we go on to some examples, um, the zero subspace, so the subspace consisting of just the zero vector, well, this, this subspace is special for the fact that it actually only has one basis, okay, and that is the empty set, okay? So the dimension of this zero subspace is zero because, hey, there's zero vectors in that basis, okay? But then once we go on to sort of higher dimensional things, it matches up with our intuition fairly well, okay? And maybe even this example matches up with our in intuition. Like there's just one vector, so it's sort of like one point in there, and it should be zero dimensional. A line is gonna be one dimensional, a plane is gonna be two dimensional, and well, in this next example, we're gonna see that the dimension of Rn is, well, you probably have a guess in the back of your mind, and that guess is right, but let's see how we actually show it. What is the dimension of Rn, okay? Well, what we do is we construct some basis of Rn, and we've already seen a basis of this space, the standard basis, okay? So remember, if you just stick all of these standard basis vectors together into a set, you get a basis of Rn, okay? So what you do now is you just count up how many vectors are in there. Well, there's one, there's two, there's three, da 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 da, da. Uh, There's n vectors in that set. That set is a basis, so therefore the dimension is n. Okay, we found a basis with n vectors, so that must be what the dimension is. Okay, there are lots of other bases of Rn out there, but they're all going to have n vectors. All right, let's do a maybe more in-depth example. Okay, let's find a basis for this subset, sorry, the subspace of R3. Okay, so it's going to be living in three-dimensional space, but it's just the subspace of it. And what it is, is it's going to be the span of these three vectors of v equals 1, 2, 3, and w is 3, 2, 1, and x is 1, 1, 1. So we're going to compute, hey, we're going to figure out sort of what is that subspace, and then we'll compute its dimension. Okay, so to compute the dimension of this subspace, we've got to figure out a basis of the subspace. And maybe the most natural first guess for a basis of this subspace would be, well, why don't we just take the vectors v, w, and x, throw them into a set, and check if that's a basis, okay? Certainly, certainly it spans S, so sort of half of our work is done already, okay? This set here, VWX, that spans S just by definition of S, so we just need to check the linear independence of it, okay? If it's linear ind linearly independent, then yeah, it's a basis. All right, so let's check that. Is this set linearly independent? So remember from last week, the way you check linear independence of a set is you stick the vectors from that set into a matrix as columns, okay? So I just stuck V, W and X in as columns. Here's V, here's W, here's X. And augment with a zero right-hand side. And then you're, che you're checking. One of two things is gonna happen. Either this linear system has a unique solution, all zeros, or it has infinitely many solutions, okay? If it's unique, linearly independent. If it's infinitely many, linearly dependent. 
Okay, so let's figure out which of those happens. So just get down into row echelon form, do a couple of row operations to get zeros down here, and then do one more to get a zero down there, and then we'll be in row echelon form. Great, now we're in row echelon form and we're just asking how many solutions are there? Well, leading entry, leading entry. There's no leading entry down here though. Okay, so this third column here, that's corresponding to a free variable. Okay, because there's a free variable, there are infinitely many solutions, so the set is actually linearly dependent. Okay, so no, it's not a basis. It doesn't have that second property. It doesn't have that linearly independent property. Okay, so how can we patch this up? How can we fix this so that it actually is a basis of S? Okay, well, remember linear dependence, what that means is that one of the vectors is a linear combination of the other ones. Okay, and in this case, it turns out that actually each of these vectors can be written as a linear combination of the other two. No matter which one I pick, you can write as a linear combination of the other two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, X, that's a linear combination of V and W. Okay, so why don't I just throw away X? Okay, instead of testing if V, W, X is a basis of S, I'll just get rid of the X in there. Just ask, is V, W, is that a basis of S? Okay, it's still gonna span S, because X is in the span of these two first two vectors. So sort of nothing was lost from the span. Okay, and then you just gotta check linear independence and that just boils down to, you know, they're not multiples of each other. Okay, so here we've shown that VWX, that's not a basis. Now I'm gonna sort of leave this as an exercise to you. Show that VW is a basis. Okay, so this is something you check. You gotta check linear independence and spanning. It's not too hard to do either though. Okay, same method that we've seen. Um, and once you see that that is a basis, then you know, oh great, that means that S is two-dimensional. Okay, so what's happening here is even though on the surface it looks like, you know, S should be three-dimensional because it's the span of three vectors, actually all three of those vectors, they're living on a common plane though. So there's sort of a redundancy there. Linear independence is violated. So no, it's not a basis and it's not three-dimensional. It's just a two-dimensional plane. You can find a basis with just two vectors. All right, let's go now to our other favorite types of subspaces, okay? Let's look at the range and null space of a matrix. We've seen how to sort of describe these in general. We've seen how to come up with sets of vectors that span these two subspaces. Now let's see how to actually find bases of these two subspaces. Let's, let's show how to find a basis of the range of a matrix and a basis of the null space of a matrix, okay? So here's just some ugly matrix. We're gonna find a basis of its range. We're gonna find a basis of its null space. All right, and let's just work on one of them at a time. It's maybe a little bit easier to do the null space just because we've basically seen the method before, okay? So what we're gonna do to find a basis of the null space, we're gonna do what we always do. We're gonna solve the linear system, right? The null space, it's the set of solutions to AX equals zero. It's just a linear system, let's just solve it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the matrix A, augment it with zeros on the right-hand side, row reduce, I'm gonna go all the way to reduced row echelon form just to make it a little bit easier to do, to make it a little bit easier to see what the basis is, okay? So I start off by getting zeros down here below the leading entry in the leftmost column, okay? So I have three row, throw three row operations there to get three zero entries. Next up, I wanna get a zero entry down here below the, the two two leading entry, okay? So one more row operation to do there. Okay, so I did this row operation to get a zero down here. And now my le next leading entry is over here, it's this one, and I need to get a zero down there. So I've got another row operation that I've got to do. So let's do that. Okay, and now this is in reduced row echelon form. So I'm basically done at this point, okay? That's the reduced row echelon form. That's as simple as I can make that linear system via row operations. Okay, so now I'm gonna remember, what does this actually mean in terms of the linear system? Well, each of the columns in my matrix corresponds to a variable in the linear system, okay? So I'm just gonna call the variables x1 up to x5. And what this is telling me is, well, wherever I've got a leading entry, that variable is leading. And wherever I don't have a leading entry, well, those variables are free. So x3 and x5 are gonna be free, and the others are leading. All right, so what that means is I can write my leading entries in terms of, or sorry, I can write my leading variables in terms of my free variables. So I'm gonna do that. Okay, so, so far nothing is new. If I just asked you, hey, solve this linear system, this is what you would do. Okay, you write your leading variable in terms of free variables, leading variable in terms of free variables, leading variable in terms of free variables. So you just take each of these non-zero rows, rearrange them so that it's just leading variable on one side, everything else you move over to the other side. All right, fine and dandy. 
Now what you do is you sort of consolidate all of that information into a solution vector. Okay, so stick each of x1 up to x5 into a vector. Okay, and then you just, the way you do this is you say, okay, well, what is x1? What's the first entry? Oh, well, I wrote it down up here. It's minus x3 plus x5. What is x2? Well, I wrote it up here. It's x3 minus 2x5. What is x3? Well, x3 is already written in terms of the free variables. x3 is a free variable, so x3 is just x3. Then what is x4? Well, I wrote it up here. It's minus 3x5. And then what is x5? Again, x5 is itself. It's already free. And the point of doing it like this is after you make these substitutions, your solution vector over here, it's entirely in terms of free variables. Okay, so now you can factor them out. If I factor out x3 and x5, what I get is this expression down here. And all I've done down here is in each of the entries, I've asked how many x3s are there? Well, in the first entry, there's minus one x3s. So I put a minus one there. How many x3s are in the second entry? Well, there's one of them. In the third entry, there's one of them and then zero and zero. Okay, and then similarly over here, how many x5s in each entry? Well, just count them up in each entry and that's your vector over there. Okay, so every solution of this linear system, in other words, every member of the null space has this form. Okay, but what is that form? This form right here, this is exactly, that's a linear combination of two particular vectors. Okay, everything in the null space, something is in the null space, if and only if. It can be written as a linear combination of this vector and this vector. Okay, so that is a basis of the null space. Okay, there, I mean, we didn't actually show linear independence there, but it is a fact that if you do this method, the set of vectors that you're gonna get popping out of this method is linearly independent, okay? And that's a bit of a theorem that's in the textbook, but that's true, okay? So if you just collect these vectors into a set, each of the vectors that are multiplying a free variable, yeah, you get a basis of the null space. So in particular, we see that the, the null space is two-dimensional because there are two members in that basis. All right, let's go on to the range now. So we've done the null space, let's go to the range. Now we've already seen how to get a, our hands on the range a little bit, okay? We saw a theorem that said the range of a matrix equals the span of its columns, okay? So this was a theorem from last week, okay? But typically you don't wanna take all columns, okay? Because sometimes there are linear dependencies among those columns, okay? So sometimes taking all columns is overkill. Okay, sometimes there are sort of linear relationships between those columns and you don't need all of them. Okay, so to actually find a basis of the range, we want to take that set of columns, but sort of truncate it down until we get a basis, until we get a linearly independent set. Certainly, if we take all columns, it'll span the range, but we want to sort of truncate, truncate it down to be as small as possible. And the way you do this, Okay, sort of the quick and easy way to do this is you take the reduced row echelon form of the matrix. And fortunately, we already computed this from when we were computing the null space. Here's the reduced row echelon form of the matrix A. Okay, so I'm just gonna copy it down below here. Okay, what you do is you see, oh, these first two columns and the fourth column, those are leading. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take those columns of the original matrix A. Okay, so I'm gonna scroll back up Scroll back up to the matrix A, and I'm gonna take the first column, the second column, and the fourth column. And if I put those three columns together in a set, those three vectors in a set, I'm gonna get a basis of the range. Okay, and the reason for that is, well, I need to convince myself of two things. I need to convince myself that this set is linearly independent, and I need to convince myself that it spans the entire range. Okay. Well, sort of the point is that when you do row operations to convert A into re its reduced row echelon form, you're sort of not affecting column linear relationships, okay? Like if in the original matrix, some linear combination of the first and second and fourth column got you the third column, then in the reduced row echelon form, that exact same linear combination is gonna get you, you know, the exact same linear combination of the first, second and fourth column is still gonna get you the third column of the reduced row echelon form now. Okay, so sort of how it works here is like we can see, hey, this third column, it's the first column minus the second column, right? If I take this first column and subtract the second column, I get the third column, okay? Well, the exact same thing is gonna be true in the original matrix A. If I take the first column and subtract the second column, yeah, I do, I get the third column here. So the point is that third column is a linear combination of the columns that are in the same spots of these leading columns. 
Okay, so I don't need it for the span. I can discard it. It doesn't need to be in the basis. Okay, and similarly, if I look on the right here, this fifth column, it's minus the first column, plus two times the second column, plus three times the third column, sorry, three times the fourth column. Okay, and the exact same is gonna be true in the original matrix A. This column here, this last one, the fifth one, it's gonna be minus one times column one, plus two times column two, plus three times column four. Okay, so this fifth column, again, it's not required in a basis, okay? It's already a linear combination of other columns we picked, so just discard it, get rid of it. It's not needed, it doesn't contribute anything to the span. Okay, so these three columns here, they're still gonna span the exact same range that all of the columns span, but now it's a small enough set that it's linearly independent, okay? In linear independence, it's maybe not quite as obvious. You can still do it using the same sort of logic that we used up here, relating the reduced rational form back to the original matrix A, but eh, it's a theorem in the textbook, okay? So yes, this method will always get you a basis. You, you look at, hey, what are the leading columns in the reduced rational form? And you take those columns of the original matrix. Okay, so in particular, we see that, hey, yeah, the dimension of the range, it's going to be, well, three. It's, the range is three-dimensional in this case because the basis consists of these three vectors. Okay, and what we're going to start doing next class is we're going to look at this quantity. We're going to look at this quantity, the dimension of the range, and we're going to see that it's related to lots of other things that we've seen in this course. Okay, it's special enough that we give it a name. We call it the rank of a matrix. So for this matrix, we would say that the rank is three because its range is three dimensional. We'll start talking about that next class. So I will see you then.